I knew the basic, basics of my dad's World War II history. I knew he was a B-17 pilot. He was stationed in England with the 8th Air Force. Uh, the name of his uh, plane was named the Susan Ruth after my oldest sister, who was one year old at the time that he went overseas. He flew bombing missions over occupied Europe and, and Germany, and he was shot down over Belgium in uh, 1944. But he was able to uh, evade capture by the Germans and eventually make it back uh, to England and, and back home. But it wasn't until I retired in 2009 that I really had the time to delve into my dad's war history in further detail. And at that time, I had no intention at all of writing a book. I just wanted to go through all the material that my parents had kept from the war years and organize it and uh, kind of learn more detail. And there were two items uh, that they had, uh, had that were really uh, significant. And one was a uh, diary that my dad had written while he was missing in action about the plane being shot down. And it was absolutely riveting. Uh, so much so that it was included in two books that were written. Uh, one on the left, you can see uh, The Mighty Eight by Gerald Astor. It was about the 8th Air Force, uh, which was stationed in England during World War II and flew high altitude daylight precision bombing missions uh, over Germany and occupied Europe. Uh, the 8th Air Force was called the Mighty 8th because of the number of planes they could put up in the air on a mission. Uh, it gradually grew, and on uh, December 24th, of 1944, they had 2,000 B-17s on one mission to Berlin. Wow. I can't even imagine that. Uh, the other book was called First Over Germany by Russell Strong. Uh, it's about the 306 bomb group, which my dad was in. Russell Strong was a navigator in the 306 bomb group and became his historian uh, after the war. Uh, the 306 was called First Over Germany because they were the first uh, bomb group to bomb a target within Germany in January of 1943. Uh, the other items uh, that was most significant that my parents had kept were all the letters that my father had written my mother during the war. And reading those was absolutely fascinating. And I became fascinated with the story of my dad and his crew. And it became my passion. I started reading book after book about the air war over Europe. I went on the internet and started, uh, and did just countless, and countless hours doing research, downloading declassified military documents. I joined a number of World War II organizations and started going to their uh, reunions. Back now, I'm president of the 306 Bomb Group Historical Association. But at those reunions, I was listening to veterans uh, tell their stories. And uh, finally, in 2012, I came to the conclusion that the story of my dad and his crew was so unique and so compelling that it needed to be told and people needed to read about it. So I decided to uh, write a book. Uh, from the time I started my research to the time the book was released was four and a half years. Uh, I published the book myself. I formed a one-person limited liability company called Seabreeze Publishing, which is the name of the street that I live on in, in Seal Beach. And then I contracted with independent professionals for all the associated services, such as book uh, cover design, interior layout, uh, printing, editing, uh, fulfillment, uh, et cetera. And the book was finally released in uh, August of 2014, and it's done very well in that time. It's won 20 National Book Awards uh, since it was released. It's in uh, most all the major uh, air museums across the United States, even the Smithsonian in D.C., and I'm happy to say that uh, Sandy's going to stock a few uh, beginning today in the San Diego Air and Space Museum, so I'm real pleased about that. I probably wouldn't have written the book, though, if it hadn't have been for two Belgian gentlemen. Uh, in the upper left, you see uh, Paul Delahaye with my, with my father. Uh, the picture was taken in 1994, the 50th anniversary of the liberation of Belgium and also my dad's plane being shot down. And uh, in the lower right-hand picture, you see myself with Jacques Below. Uh, both these men were young boys during the war, uh, and they witnessed firsthand during the Nazi occupation the atrocities that they committed against their family and friends. And they were greatly affected by it. And later on in life, they became local historians. And they interviewed a number of Belgian citizens who were members of the underground. And they documented their testimony about events that took place involving my dad and his crew. And they gave me unbelievably detailed information uh, that's in the book about events that would have been lost forever without their research and documentation. So I owe them a great deal of thanks and gratitude. 
Initially, uh, my dad didn't go into the Air Force as a result of President Roosevelt's uh, implementation of the first peacetime draft in history in the fall of 1940. My dad went into the service in April of 1941. He went into the Army. He was stationed at Fort Lewis, Washington. And at the time, the U.S. military was woefully weak. They ranked 18th in the world in military strength. And they were also very ill-equipped, as you can tell by the World War I vintage uh, combat uniform that my dad has on here. Uh, a couple months later, a few months later, uh, my father married Ruth Hempel. This is their uh, wedding picture at First Lutheran Church in Pasadena. My mother was born and raised in Pasadena. My dad was actually uh, uh, born in Norfolk, Nebraska and moved to Glendale, California with his parents uh, when he was 13. It was right, uh, shortly after my mother graduated from UCLA, where she was a classmate of uh, the legendary Jackie Robinson there. I also was born in Pasadena and went to UCLA, so I'm pretty happy about the Bruins winning last night in the uh, NCAA tournament. <laughs> uh, a few months later in December, on a date which will live in infamy, on December 7th of 1941, Pearl Harbor was attacked by the Japanese and the United States was at war. Well, my mother was uh, very uh, afraid at that time and, and fearful, so she went up to visit my dad uh, in Washington over Christmas. And nine months later, Susan Ruth was born. <laughs> well, my dad having a new bride and a little uh, baby on the way, he was worried how he was going to be able to support him. He didn't think he could do it very well on a private's pay in the Army. So he decided to join the Air Force. We thought he could make some more money, especially if he went through the pilot training and became an officer. So in April of, uh, excuse me, June of 1942, uh, he entered pre-flight training at Santa Ana, California, and then went through the various stages of pilot training. This slide's a little difficult uh, to decipher, but there were three basic st stages. Let me turn this on. No, this isn't even working. Oh, well. <laughs> My click is not a, but the first stage was primary uh, training, which he took at uh, Santa Maria, California. And then after that, they uh, went into uh, basic training, which he took at Lemoore, California. The basic training, they separated the pilots out. Uh, some pilots went into single engine planes or fighters, and others went into uh, multi engine planes, which would be bombers or transports. Uh, typically, the shorter pilots went into fighters because they were, the cockpits were so small in those aircraft. But I think also it depended on personality. The fighter pilots tended to be more individualistic, risk takers, kind of have larger egos, and uh, the uh, bomber pilots tended to be more level-headed and team players. My dad was six foot three, so he went into uh, to bombers, and then they went into uh, advanced uh, pilot training. Here's a picture of my dad in uh, primary training at Santa Maria. I think everyone smoked back then. How, yeah. how old was he at that time? Uh, at that time, he was 27. Actually, he was an old guy. He was curious. Yeah, he was 28 when he was shot down, so he was considered an old man. Uh, these are the three planes that my dad uh, flew in pilot training. Right. Up on the top there, you see an old Stearman biplane, and then in basic training, he flew a a uh, multi-valiant uh, single wing plane, and then advanced training, he uh, flew a, a twin engine, uh, Curtis Wright 18-9. My dad graduated from advanced pilot training in uh, April of 1943, where he earned his uh, commission as a second lieutenant and received his pilot's wings. Uh, from there, he went uh, to transitional training, where he learned how to fly a four-engine B-17 bomber and then on to operational crew training where the various members of the crew came together and they learned to operate as a team. And then finally on October 21st of 1943, my dad and his crew were assigned to the 306 Bomb Group at Thurlie, England, which is located about 60 miles north of London. This is what the base looked like back then. Uh, the airfield's no longer there. My wife and I visited there in 2014 and the surrounding countryside looks pretty much the same. It's very rural. Uh, little hamlets uh, spread throughout uh, the area, country roads running through out. It's uh, very quaint. This is the insignia of the 306 Bomb Group. In the 8th Air Force, there were three air divisions. Uh, the 306 was in the 1st Air Division, which was signified by a triangle. 
And then the 306 bomb group, its designation was the letter H. Some of you might recall the movie 12 O'Clock High starring Gregory Peck. Mm -hmm. Well, it's actually a true story uh, based on the 306 bomb group. The fictitious bomb group in the movie, the 918th, was derived by multiplying the 306 by three. <laughs> Uh, the three, there were four squadrons within the, uh, uh, the bomb group up in the upper left hand corner of the clay pigeons, so named by a journalist because they took such heavy losses during the war. Uh, then you have the eager beavers, uh, the grim reapers, and then uh, the lower right hand corner, my dad's squadron, the 369th fight and bite. I always like to point out uh, the ground crews. Although the combat crews got all the glory and the recognition, it was really these ground crews that kept these planes flying. After these bombers came back after a mission, these crews, ground crews would stay up all night in horrible weather, uh, doing maintenance on the plane, uh, repairing bomb damage, uh, battle damage, refueling, arming the plane. And they were really the unsung heroes. Actually, they considered these planes their plane they just lend it to the combat crews occasionally to fly missions. This is my dad's crew. Uh, B-17 had a 10-man crew. They had four officers who were kneeling in front. Uh, my dad's on the lower left. Uh, he was the first pilot and as such the com commander of the crew and the plane. And then you have going across uh, the co-pilot the navigator and the bombardier, and behind them you have six uh, enlisted men, non-commissioned officers, NCOs, who were mainly gunners. Uh, five of these men made it back home, five of them did not. Uh, this plane is not the Susan Ruth, it's just the plane that they took the crew picture in front of when they got to England. But you'll notice the, uh, the nose art in the upper left-hand co corner. I love the nose art. Uh, the, it's interesting that the Air Force was the only entity that allowed their planes to be painted. Uh, the Marines didn't, the Navy didn't, nor did any other country, but the Air Force thought it would help morale if they could let these young guys name and uh, paint their planes. And uh, they were very creative in what they named and painted their planes. Many times it was a cartoon character, but more often than not, it was a nude woman. You know, after all, these guys are in their late teens and early 20s and were very young guys. <laughs> The 306 flew uh, B-17 bombers, uh, nicknamed the Flying Fortress, because of the armament that they carried on the plane. They had 12 to 13 caliber, uh, 50 to, or 50 caliber machine guns that could put out a lot of firepower. Also, they could take a tremendous amount of battle damage and continue flying. Uh, there were three models of B-17s flown in the war, an E and F and a G. That was, this was the last model. You can always tell the G model by the chin turret uh, under the nose of the plane. Then each plane had a tail markings that identified them. Again, you see the triangle H of the 1st Air Division and the 306 Bomb Group. And then each plane had an identification number that was assigned by the manufacturer when they were built. Uh, Boeing designed and manufactured about 64% of the B-17s, and uh, then the remainder, about 18%, were manufactured by Lockheed Vega and another 18% by the Douglas Corporation. Here you see the crew positions on the plane. In the front of the plane, in the plexiglass nose, again, this is the uh, G model, because you can see the chin turret. You have the uh, bombardier, and then behind him, you have the uh, navigator. And then above them, uh, above them, you have the two pilots. Uh, and then uh, behind them, you have the flight engineer, or the top turret gunner. And then you have the bomb bay. Behind the bomb bay, the radio operator. And then below him, the ball turret gunner, two waist gunners, and a tail gunner. Here you see the position of the little... <laughs> bomb, the bombs hung in the bomb bay on racks on either side of the plane. It was a narrow, very cramped area. You have a little narrow catwalk that's eight inches wide that ran between the bombs. This boy is only eight years old, so you can see how cramped that is in there. And it wasn't uncommon for bombs to get hung up in these racks during a mission, which required one of the crewmen to either knock it loose with a wrench or kick it loose with his foot. And if you can envision that, when those bomb bay doors are open, you're looking five miles straight down to the, down to the earth, the winds howling all around you. It took a lot of bravery to, to do that. Here you see the crew positions a little clearer. This is an F model because it doesn't have that chin turret under the nose. 
uh, but you have the bombardier up in front there, and his job was to uh, drop the bombs accurately. But in the G model, when they were under attack by enemy fighters, he manned the chin turret. Then you have the navigator behind him, and he needed to know where they were and where they were going at all times. But uh, he also manned the cheek guns that was on each side of the plane when they were under attack. And then above them were the two pilots. In the left seat, you had the first pilot. In the right seat, you had the co-pilot. And you needed two pilots to fly these planes, not only because if one was injured or killed, the other one had another pilot to fly the plane, but also that it was very strenuous, both mentally and physically, to fly these aircraft. These missions lasted eight to 10 hours, so it was uh, very fatiguing. Uh, they had to stay alert at all times because they flew in tight formations, and if they lost concentration, they could clip a wing on the plane next to them or run into the plane in front of them and go down, which happened occasionally. Also, they had to fight the turbulence all the time, not only the air turbulence that uh, you know, churned up the sky, but also the wake turbulence and the prop wash from all those other B-17s, you know, in such proximity to one another. And then above the, uh, the pilot, she had the flight engineer, who was really the mechanic on the plane. Uh, but when it was under attack, he manned the top turret. He helped monitor all the uh, instruments that were in the plane. In the cockpit, there were over 150 different gauges, toggles, switches, and dials that they had to uh, keep their eye on. The flight engineer helped monitor engine performance and fuel consumption. Uh, got a question. I've always wondered when they were firing their their armament, how did they stop from shooting down their own airplanes? Because they flew in very tight box formations. Right. Well, the, the guns had uh, stops on them, so they could only go so far, so high. But that that was a problem. You know, it it wasn't unheard of that with one plane would uh, hit another plane. Well, how was it when they designed that uh, initially uh, that they felt this would be more than adequate defense against the Messerschmitt, uh, uh, the, the attack or the Fokker? You know, how, how, how was it when they did this, they felt that the, this was adequate armament? I'll get to that in just a minute. <laughs> 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 and then behind the, the, the bomb bay, you have the radio operator. He had the most comfortable position on the plane. He had kind of a spacious, relatively speaking, room, a chair to sit at. And then the most cramped position on the plane was the ball turret gunner. Again, these missions lasted eight to 10 hours, and he's in that fetal position, you know, just cramped in that ball for a long time. He had to be a, a man of sm small stature. And then above the ball, you had two waist gunners on either side, which is a fairly exposed position. In the F model, those windows were open, so it was really cold if you're a, a waist gunner. And then another cramped position in the back of the plane was the tail gunner. My father flew his first combat mission on November 3rd of 1943 on a mission to Wilhelmshaven, Germany. It was the first time the 8th Air Force put up over 500 bombers on a mission. And flying combat was extremely dangerous and brutal. Uh, there were 26,000 men in the 8th Air Force who were killed during World War II. That's more than the entire Marine Corps fighting in the, in the Pacific. There was another 28,000 men who became prisoners of, of war after their bombers were knocked out of the sky by German fighters or German air, anti-aircraft fire. It was the most dangerous duty assignment in the U.S. military during World War II was to be uh, an 8th Air Force combat crewman. Yeah, I had read some play that only the German U-boat corps had a higher ratio than the Ace Air Force. That is correct. You didn't want to be in a U-boat. <laughs> uh, first of all, uh, just taking off, uh, this slide might be a little cramped to see, but there were 40 bomb groups in the 8th Air Force in an area called East Anglia in England, which is about the size of Vermont. And these bases were only about 5 or 10 miles apart. So on the day of the mission, you had hundreds of these bombers all taken off at the same time. And back then, there was no uh, air traffic control, there was no radar. Everything was based on visual sight, and with the English weather being socked in, usually they couldn't see anything until, above, until they got above the cloud layer. So mid-air collisions were not uncommon, you know, just trying to get up in the air. And then they had to form up. Uh, individual planes formed up into three-plane elements 
elements formed up into bomb squadrons, bomb squadrons formed up into bomb groups, bomb groups formed up into combat wings, combat wings formed up into air divisions, and all this took an hour to two hours before they could even head across the English Channel to begin their mission. And then the next problem were the elements. These planes weren't pressurized, so above 10,000 feet they had to go on oxygen or else they'd pass out and in a couple minutes die. Also, it was extremely cold. It was mighty, minus 40 to 60 degrees below zero. So frostbite was a huge problem. There are lots of airmen that were hospitalized uh, for lengthy periods of time with serious frostbite injuries. Here you see the typical uh, combat gear of uh, a crewman. This is a, a waist gunner. Uh, he's wearing a steel combat helmet. Uh, and then you see his uh, tinted goggles because of the brightness of the sky at that altitude in his, uh, his uh, oxygen mask, and he's wearing a flak jacket. It was like an apron that had metal plates in the front and the back that would try to protect them. Uh, his fleece line jacket, uh, fleece line pants, thermal gloves and boots, and then you'll see the white strap around his waist. That was a parachute harness. They didn't actually wear their parachutes in the plane because it, it, the conditions were so <coughs> cramped. Uh, so if they needed to bail out, they had to have the wherewithal uh, to find their parachute, hook it on the, uh, the straps, or the, put it on the straps of the harness, and then bail out of the plane. Mm -hmm. And you'll see the you see the creative nose art there. On, on I, this I one. have read someplace that they eventually had electrical heating elements in those suits. Yeah, they wore electrical suits that they had plug in, okay. but uh, they would short out. There's, if you talk to especially. Uh, Ball turret gunners, let's see a lot of stories about yeah. those. <laughs> so I would imagine that flak jacket was adequate for flak, but not for a machine gun. Right, yeah, yeah, no. Yeah, so again, go ahead. How much did that did they have to shed before they could use the parachutes? Oh, uh, well, pretty much just the, uh, the flak jacket, and they could, they could put it on. So I'm thinking of the weight of that. Outfit would oh yeah, but and again, these planes were so cramped. You can see how bulky this yeah. is to try to move around, and you know how the navigator, you know, worked all his instruments with those, you know, bulky gloves on. I don't know. The next thing they had to worry about was enemy fighters. Uh, the Germans had radar stations uh, established along the continental coast of Europe, so they knew when these bombers were coming, and they'd send up their air force, the Luftwaffe, to intercept them. Uh, here you see a waist gunner again that is 50 caliber machine gun, uh, again with his uh, flak jacket on and his uh, oxygen mask. You see all those spent cartridges on the floor. And then the ammunition uh, came in belts. Uh, they were 27 feet long, so if a gu gunner fired the whole belt, he said uh, he fired the whole nine yards, and that's where that expression came from. <laughs> At the beginning of the war, it was 8th Bomber Command's belief that these B-17s being so heavily armed and flying in those tight formations could defend themselves from enemy aircraft. Uh, they didn't think they needed uh, fighter support. Uh, they flew in what was called the combat box formation, and this is the box here you see of a combat wing. They were three-dimensional uh, designs, and then within the combat wing box you have three boxes representing combat or bomb groups. And then with each, with each bomb group box, you have three squadron boxes. And then there was a high group and a lead group in the middle and then a low, low group. And they thought all this interlocking firepower could defend themselves from the German fighters. Here you see another position uh, on top. is a, the top view, view of a, a bomb group. And then on the right-hand side, you see you know, a side view. And then on the left, you see a, a tail view of the formation. Unfortunately, these bombers could not defend themselves from any enemy aircraft. The 8th Air Force took horrendous losses in uh, especially 1943. Uh, they, uh, the average number of missions uh, crewmen flew before being shot down was six. It was statistically impossible when they finally implemented a mission limit of 25 to give the crewmen some hope of making it through the war. In April 1943, it was statistically impossible for anyone to make it 
to 25 missions. Uh, this all culminated in October of 1943 in what they call Black Week. Over four missions, they lost 148 bombers. That's almost 1,500 men. Uh, the worst day being Black Thursday, October 14th, when they bombed this uh, Bulgarian factory at Schweinfurt, Germany. They lost 60 bombers in one day. That's 600 men. And the 8th Air Force after that was in shock. Uh, they seriously dis uh, considered discontinuing daylight bombing, and they actually had to stand down uh, because they lost so many bombers. The, uh, the 306 bomb group lost 10 out of 15 planes that they put up that day. There's and then, what? Yeah, it was, uh, it was called the second Swainford raid because the first Swainford raid, which was also horrendous, was uh, earlier in August. My dad... Uh, they needed to replace so many crews and bombers that were lost that mission. My dad was actually a replacement crew uh, f for that mission because the Black Thursday, the Swineford raid was on October 14th and my dad reported on October 21st. And when they finally decided, well, we, did, we have to give these planes escorts, uh, the problem with that was is that the P-38 Lightnings and the P-47 Thunderbolts didn't have the fuel capacity to escort these bombers all the way to the target. Uh, they could make it across the channel into, into France or the Netherlands uh, for a ways, but then they had to turn around before they ran out of fuel. Well, the Luftwaffe would just wait until those U.S. fighters would turn back for England and then they'd come in for the, for the kill. It wasn't until the P-47s uh, were had uh, external fuel tanks, drop tanks added at the end of 43 and the introduction of the P-51 Mustang that they finally had escorts that uh, could go all the way to the target and back. Uh, the P-51 Mustang was uh, especially uh, effective. They virtually wiped out the Luftwaffe in uh, the beginning of 1944. By the time D-Day rolled around on June 6th, there wasn't a German fighter in the air over the beaches of Normandy. The next thing they had to face was uh, German anti-aircraft fire. Here you see a flak gun. A flak was the abbreviation for the German word for aircraft defense cannon. And these were deadly weapons. They fired 20 shells a minute, and they, the shells were calibrated to explode at the same altitude that the planes were flying. And these shells were filled with all different sh shapes and sizes of razor-sharp metal called shrapnel. And when these the shells exploded, the shrapnel would just burst out hundreds of feet and could easily penetrate the thin aluminum skin of these planes. As the skin was so thin on these planes, you could take a screwdriver and just poke it right through. Uh, from a distance, you know, they didn't look too menacing. They just looked like little innocent black puffs. Uh, but as they got closer, these puffs got bigger and the, the, the sound got louder. And when they got in the killing field, I mean, these the concussion from these shells exploding would just violently rock the ship. If a bomber got hit with a direct uh, blast, it would basically just explode and disappear. If it hit a ring wing, these bombers would just drop like a stone. I can't imagine what that must have been like. Even though it was so cold in these planes, my dad said he would just be sweating profusely during, the, during these bombies, the bombing runs. When they neared the target, they reached a point called the IP, or initial point, where they started their bomb run. And at that time, the first pilot gave control over the plane to the bombardier, who flew the plane through, which was talked about earlier, the Norton bomb site, which was a revolutionary device at the time. It was an analog computer that could calculate different factors, such as the speed of the plane, uh, wind speed, crosswinds, so that they could accurately drop the bombs. And I mentioned it was highly secretive. The bombardiers had to sign an oath that they would defend this uh, the Norton bomb site with their life, if need be, and destroy the bomb site if they, they went down. Although little did they know at the time that the Germans had a spy, Hermann Lang, in the Norton bomb site factory in 1938, and the Germans knew all about the Norton bomb site. There's also a mount on that that your 45 would fit in, too, so you could destroy it with your 45. Huh. Pretty good. Here you see the bombardier looking through the crosshairs of the Norton bomb site. After he dropped the bombs, he'd yell bombs away, and that signaled the first pilot to take control of the plane again. And then he would make a big turn to get the hell out of there and get to another pre-designated point called a rally point, where these bombers that made it through the bomb run would try to form up again and then head back to England. 
It was on a bombing mission to Frankfurt on February 8th of 1944 when my dad's plane dropped their bombs successfully, but the bomb bay got hit by flak and they couldn't get the doors back up. And as a result, that caused a drag in the plane and they lost airspeed and they couldn't keep up with the formation. And two Fock Wolf German fighters. Notice uh, his gloves. Mittens. They're mittens. You're right from the Look, yeah, like, 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 oh, only one finger. In, 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 See the in, finger? Yeah. That's because he's doing the drip knobs. <laughs> and to the point, before you continue, um, only daytime. Only daytime. So no infrared, nothing. Uh, okay, where, where is the, <coughs> the British primarily bombed yeah, at British night? British bombed at night. And with a different type of sighting, or was it They time? did carpet bombing, with, with, and they flew in trail, trail formation. Trail formation, they had, okay. They had, they had a signal that they transmitted from Britain that set up an arc over the target. Yeah. Then they had another signal that lined up with the target. <laughs> the British planes would follow the arc, and then the bomb deer would turn control of the bomb bay over to the radio, and as soon as you hit that cross point, they would release the bomb form. Yeah. And also, later in the war, the British and the Americans used the radar stick called H2S. They nicknamed it Mickey Mouse. But it wasn't as precise as the Northern site. Right. Yeah, the, the British bombed at night, and what someone mentioned, uh, area bombing or carpet bombing, and they bombed cities. They thought they could demoralize the, the German population to end the war earlier. Whereas the, the Americans the daylight precision bombing, uh, trying to hit uh, military and industrial targets to pre then prevent the Germany's ability to wage war. That's not to say that you know the Norton bomb site and the American bombings didn't do a lot of collateral damage as well. So my dad's plane was uh, singled, up, uh, singled out by uh, two German Focke-Wolf fighters, 190s. Uh, this is uh, what they looked like. In the ensuing air battle, the Susan Ruth was shot down. Uh, two of the crewmen died in the plane. The other eight were able to bail out. Uh, both those German fighters, however, were both shot down. Uh, one piloted by Siegfried Merrick crashed, and he died in the plane. And the other was piloted by Hans Berger, who was able to bail out, and he made it through the war. While I was doing my research, one day my wife said, well, why don't you try to find the German pilot that shot down your dad's flight? And I, you know, I'm thinking, what a crazy ridiculous <laughs> idea. That, you know, how on earth am I going to do that? But lo and behold, I found Hans Berger. Mm -hmm. And fortunately for me, he became a translator after the war, so he speaks English. And he gave me some wonderful insight, which is in the book, about what it was like to go up against the Air Force. It was a deadly proposition for the, most all of his friends died in the war. How did, how did they get shot down? <laughs> well, Hans was shot down by my dad's gunners. Oh, before he Yeah, they shot, shot each other down, team. actually. Yeah, and they shot each other down. And then the other, it, well, they couldn't determine who shot down the other plane. <coughs> it, was, it was hard to determine, because there was all these different P-17s, and also if you have fighters uh, in the area, they're, they're all shooting each other at the same time, so it's, a lot of times it's really difficult to tell. Who shot down what plane? Well, I, I've seen photographs from the German planes that you're shooting at a B-17, and they were using cannons with explosive shells, and you could see the explosions on the B-17 as the shell hit it. It's just unbelievable. Yeah, they were, the, the Fock Wolves, they fired 20 millimeter cannon shells. Yeah. That's what that what shot the, down my and dad's and plane. The B-17, while you're getting cannon shells at you. Yeah. Unbelievable. The, uh, you know, a, a 50 caliber shell, is uh, yeah. this is a 50 caliber yeah. shell, but yeah. the 20 millimeter shells yeah. are about this big and you know about the, that well, that fat. Yeah, they, they <laughs> explode when they hit. The yeah, airplane. yeah, they were deadly. They were deadly. Yeah. They probably shot him with his 45 on the way down. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, the parachute. Yeah. yeah, I put that in the book. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Hans had to bail out twice, I mean, three times during the war, and he said guys shot at, Americans shot at him, and he bailed out. So, you know, they did it both ways. This is the Susan Ruth after he came down. Uh, my dad put the plane on autopilot before he bailed out, so the plane didn't just nose down, it kind of swirled down. 
And uh, this picture is taken by an unknown Belgian. There's over 200 time period photographs in the book, so you can visualize everything that you're reading about. Uh, a lot of my dad's helpers sent him pictures after the war, and then those two Belgian gentlemen that I mentioned earlier, uh, Paul Delahaye and Jacques Lalo, provided me with an amazing amount of pictures taken by Belgians during the war. I wonder if anyone would have stayed on the plane if he would have survived. It looks pretty. It hit pretty, pretty nicely when it hit the ground. Well, it would have been a rough landing, though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, this picture by, was taken by one of the, uh, by a, a Belgian gentleman. This, uh, my dad, he, he came down in these trees, and his parachute got hung up in those trees, and he was dangling 20 feet off the ground and couldn't get down. Fortunately for him, a couple young Belgian farmers uh, came to his rescue before the Germans got there. Uh, they went back to the farmhouse, got a ladder and some rope, and helped him uh, get down uh, a tree. This is the tree that he climbed down, and this is one of the German, uh, I mean, German, young Belgian farmers that helped him down. Henri Franken is his name, or was his name. He's not no longer with us. And it was around uh, 1 o'clock in the afternoon when this happened, so they told him to stay put and hide until it got dark, because there was German patrols combing the area uh, looking for him. That night they came back and got him and they took him to the other young Belgium's parents' farmhouse. His name was uh, Raymond Durvan. And this house is it's still there today. Uh, it's right on the French-Belgium border, the houses in Belgium, but the trees there are in France. <laughs> and he stayed there one night. They thought it was too dangerous for him to stay there any longer than that with those German patrols in the area. <coughs> so a uh, Belgium's customs officer, Paul Tilquin, uh, came on a tandem bicycle and, and got him to move him to another location. Uh, they took off that night. It was pitch black. My dad said raining cats and dogs, and he had shrapnel wounds in one leg and could only pedal with his good leg. And they came to a hill, and they had to get off the bike because they couldn't. They didn't have enough power to pedal, push it up. They pedal it up. The hill. <laughs> when they got to the top of the hill, there was a cafe, a cabaret there. The lights were on, music was coming out, they heard a lot of noise and laughter, and all of a sudden two German officers walk out with a couple of young girls, uh, their arms around. And one of them comes up to my dad, puts his arm around my dad, and asks for a light for a cigarette. Wow. Well, my dad was petrified, he couldn't speak German, but fortunately Paul could. He lit the guy's cigarette, and they let my dad and Paul go on their way. I guess they were too drunk. He said, my dad said they were clobbered. Uh, and too interested in the girls to pay these two guys much attention that were walking a bike in the rain. And there's a number of uh, instances like that in the book where my dad came close to being <coughs> captured. After that, he was moved around a lot. Uh, how long he stayed at any uh, given place depended on how brave the people were that lived there and how dangerous the underground uh, thought it was for him to stay there. He might stay one night at one location and six weeks at another location. Uh, here are two of the help, my dad's helpers who we became close with and stayed in contact with after the war. On the left is Ghislaine Bayou. It was with her and her husband Maurice that my dad wrote his uh, diary about the plane being shot down. And on the right is uh, Jeanette Gaden. Her husband, Andre, was a captain in the French army who had been captured uh, in 1940 when Germany invaded France and Belgium and he spent the remainder of the war in a prisoner of war camp. It, uh, my dad was so grateful for these people. Without them, he wouldn't have made it. Uh, and these people were extremely courageous and extremely brave. Not only did they risk their lives hiding down airmen, but they risked the lives of their friends and their family. And several of the Belgium helpers that either helped my dad or other members of the crew were sent to concentration camps or, or shot, and some died. They were extremely brave people. Normally it was uh, the procedure for the underground to try to get down airmen out of occupied Europe and back to England uh, through various escape routes, uh, down through France over the Pyrenees into Spain and then out through British control Gibraltar. But something always went wrong trying to get my dad out. So finally he got fed up with uh, hiding and he joined the French resistance uh, called the Mackey. And the Mackie were a ragtime, rag ragtag group of guerrillas. Uh, there were small groups and bands spread throughout France that would harass the Germans. Uh, they took, uh, they were connected with the British uh, by uh, coded messages uh, over the BBC. 
and they would get airdrops of supplies from the British uh, at nighttime. And they would uh, harass the Germans, uh, attack convoys, try to assassinate German uh, officers and, and the such, disrupt communications. And there's several uh, instances in the book of my dad in uh, fight with, with the resistance. This is a house they stayed in for a while in France, just across the border from Belgium. This farmhouse is still there today. Uh, my dad stayed in the upstairs there in those two windows. And on one occasion when a German patrol came up the road, he had to jump out that the second story and sprained his ankle and then hiked, but hightailed it into the woods to avoid being captured. This next picture I absolutely love. Again, who took this picture and how it ever got back to my father, I don't know, but this is him jumping out of a Jeep fighting with the resistance. Where would they get the Jeep from? Um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. I don't know if it could have been airdropped or not. Could your father speak Belgium or German or anything? No, and, you know, that's... Uh, he said by the time he joined the Mackey, he could speak conversational French yeah, pretty good. Yeah. But, you know, when he first bailed out, you can imagine how stressful it was to be a downed airman. You know, first of all, you have the shock of being, your plane being knocked out of the sky, the plane's on fire, you have to bail out, you come down in a foreign country, you have no idea where you are, uh, you can't communicate uh, with the military, you have no idea what happened to your buddies on the plane. Uh, you can't speak the language. You have to just depend 100% on people that you don't know at all. Any of them could be collaborators and turn you over to the German police, the Gestapo. And when you're in one of those houses hiding, the Gestapo at any time could just break in and you'd be arrested or shot. And uh, my dad was almost captured a couple of times when he was in, in houses. Then finally, seven months after he was shot down, uh, he hooked up with Patton's Third Army, uh, who came, had come up through France after D-Day and, and came into France. He went up to an Army major, identified himself as a downed U.S. airman, and then went, got made it to Paris and then back to England and then back home to the U.S. Seven months, huh? Yeah, my uh, other sister was born while he was missing in action. Mm -hmm. So I can't imagine how hard it was for my mother. Here she was back home with a one-year-old baby girl, and a, or one-year-old girl, and then a brand new uh, a baby girl, not knowing whether my dad was dead or alive. They were shot down on February 8th. She got a telegram from the War Department on February 23rd saying that my dad was missing in action, and then she didn't know what happened until the following September when my dad got back to England and sent her a telegram saying that he was alive. Wow. When you were missing in action, did your family continue to be paid, or how did that work? How well, did she live? Or? Yeah, and it's funny, and the, the telegram, I forget exactly, that he sent back to uh, uh, my mother in September, he said something like, bank the checks, honey, or sweetie, or something like that, yeah. So he'd still be paid. I think they probably continued paying. Uh, Belgium is a unique country. It's really divided in two. The northern half of Belgium is called Flanders, where they speak Dutch, and it's rather industrial. And the lower half of Belgium is called Wallonia, where they speak French, and it's very rural and uh, all farmland. And my parents, uh, or my parents, uh, my dad and his crew in the plane, they, they came down right around here, right at the border with France. Actually, my dad and the plane both came down in Belgium, but the rest of the crew that bailed out came down in France. And then just across the border in France was that farmhouse that the resistance stayed in and the village, Trilon, France, where my dad hooked up with Patton's Third Army. I've been to Belgium four times, and uh, it's a wonderful little country, even though it's so small, there's, it's, it's full of things to see. And the people are absolutely wonderful. To this day, they are still so grateful and thankful for the Americans and allies coming to their rescue to free them from Nazi oppression. And they, uh, they have ceremonies at various memorials in the area on an annual basis uh, to celebrate and commemorate that event. Uh, the big celebration, though, was around uh, September 2nd of each year, the liberation of Belgium. And I've been to that several times, and the, the, the celebrations last several days. This is the poster uh, from, 19, excuse me, from 2014. 
in their wonderful functions. They erect a huge tent. This is just a portion of the tent uh, that you can see. And uh, they have band concerts and dances and lunches and dinners. Uh, they're really fun events. Uh, all the volunteers dress up in time period uh, uniforms and the local beer <laughs> chimay just flows. Everyone has a grand time. And they have uh, a number of uh, ceremonies in the, at memorials in the area. This memorial is actually at Sendron, which is right at the French-Belgian border where the 9th U.S. Infantry crossed over into, from France into Belgium to liberate the country. And all the villagers uh, come out, all the local dignitaries give speeches, the U.S. military comes, da comes down, the local air base there, Belgian military, French military. And they do a wonderful job of educating the younger generations, too, to remember uh, what happened. You can see all these kids lined up here, uh, and they include them on the ceremonies. It, it, they're wonderful events. Uh, this is the memorial that they erected to my dad and his crew in Mackinois, Belgium. It's about 100, 150 yards from where the plane went down. This memorial was erected in 1989, and my dad didn't really talk a lot about his war experiences prior to this. But he and three other members of the crew that were still living at the time went over for the dedication. And he was reunited with many of the Belgian people that hit him during the war, saw those homes, and that brought it all back and he started talking about it after that. I was privileged to go over in 1994 uh, with my parents, and that's when it became personal for me. So I got to meet a couple of his helpers that were still living in Salvo's places myself. Uh, you see two plaques on the front of it there. They list the names of the crew, their ages at the time that the plane went down, and their positions on the plane. Well, what happened to the rest of his crew? You need to read the book. <laughs> <laughs> and if you order now, you can get some. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> For the commemorative bags. Yeah. I have, some, I have some here if anyone wants to get one. I'll rent you mine. <laughs> <laughs> and this is Hans Berger today. Um, last May, I went over to uh, actually to Belgium for three days and filmed uh, all the locations that are talked about in the book, and then went over to Munich. Uh, he, Hans is 93 years old now, still rides a bike every day, and we've developed quite a friendship. You're, you're mentioning, you know, those pictures uh, of German fighters. You know. he, well, he, he, we, we brought out his logbook and showed me the entry of the mm. day on February 8th of 44, where he shot down a B-17 and he had to bail out. But he also had these pictures for, that he took for this gun camera, mm. where you have a sight and you have a B-17, you know, exploding, or a B-24, really eerie. Here you see my dad and me in 2004. Uh, he wanted to see the World War II memorial before he died. So I accompanied him on a trip, uh, the, a reunion, with the Air Force's Escape and Evasion Society, which was actually in Pennsylvania. We took a bus down to the memorial. It was just before it was his, its official dedication, uh, about a month later. And that was the last trip he ever took. Uh, my dad died in 2007 at the age of 91. He wasn't the last crew member to die, but he was the oldest crew member. And virtually all the World War II vets are in their 90s today. At the end of the war, there were 16 million World War II veterans. 97% of those men are no longer with us. There was no other event in history that affected more people than World War II. 60 million people died, millions more were wounded, millions more were uh, left homeless and displaced. There was, it changed the course of the United States and the world forever. And the, the, Brave young men who fought and died for freedom were without doubt you know, members of the greatest generation and their sacrifice can never be forgotten. It's our duty to remember. Thank you. Mm -hmm.